Nowadays, most people haven't heard of Timur, also known as Timurlane. He would hate this fact as he spent his entire life trying to live up to the man he considered his ancestor, Genghis Khan. He tried to outdo Genghis Khan in a number of ways, but the most shocking from a modern standpoint was how he found horrifying ways to punish people. In fact, by the time Timur died, his actions had been responsible for killing over 17 million people, or 5% of the world's population at the time. For comparison, to kill 5% of the world's population today, you would have to kill 400 million people. Most of his victims were killed by bloodthirsty wars, but those who betrayed him suffered far, far worse deaths. In fact, his methods of execution make modern-day killers seem like teddy bears. But to understand how and why Timur became such an evil ruler, you need to understand his origins. Today, archaeologists show us how much of an evil ruler Timur really was. How Timur's childhood turned him into a monster At some time in the 1320s or 1330s, a baby is born to two nobles within the Barlas Mongolian tribe. This tribe is based in modern-day Uzbekistan. In the 1300s, the Barlas people are some of the most influential in the region, thanks to their ancestors being early supporters of the legendary Genghis Khan. From day one, the parents have high hopes for their baby. They name him Timur because it means iron. Clearly, they hope this means that the child will grow up to be strong and to crush his enemies. Timur shows signs that he's just as strong as his parents want him to be. He's a leader among his peers and soon he forms a gang that wreaks havoc on those who come too close to the tribe. Timur and the other kids set up ambushes along the roads that travelers take. When these travelers are trapped, the children rush in, stealing whatever goods they can take. Most of all, they raid livestock and bring it back to the tribe. Soon, everyone in the tribe knows that Timur, who has not yet reached adulthood, is the one supplying them with bountiful sources of meat, milk, leather, and other goods. It seemed that Timur is destined for success, until something life-changing happens to him. Timur's First Brush With Death when Timur grows into a young man, he unsurprisingly becomes even more ambitious. He conducts ever more daring raids, knowing that the victims will almost always run in fear instead of crossing his gang. One day, Timur sets his sights on a shepherd with a large flock. He knows that those sheep will outfit his tribe with mutton and wool for a long time to come. So, he and his men rush in. But the shepherd does not back away. Instead, the shepherd pulls out a bow and arrow. As the men charge, the shepherd fires a volley of arrows. The shepherd may be a peasant, but he knows how to defend himself. Two of the arrows tear into Timur. One gets embedded in his right leg. Another connects with his right hand, knocking away his sword. The men, seeing that their leader is terribly wounded, stop, pick up Timur, and retreat. They realize that if Timur dies, then the entire tribe will be significantly worse off. Back at the tribal village, those with the most medical knowledge treat Timur. They remove the arrow from his right leg and treat the wound with medicinal substances that Timur himself had likely previously robbed from a traveler. But Timur's right hand is in worse condition. Two of his fingers need to be amputated. Amazingly, Timur does not succumb to these wounds. His mother tells him that a man of iron can pull through, and he does. But he is never the same again. Instead, he is crippled. His ability to walk is severely limited, and he knows that he will never be as effective at wielding a sword with his left hand. Timur will never be at the forefront of battle again. It seems like the young man is destined to live humbly for the rest of his years. Timur focuses on becoming a fierce tactician. Instead of giving up, Timur realizes that his charms and his intelligence were much greater weapons than his sword. His years of raiding have given him an expert knowledge of how to strike fear in the hearts of his enemies, so he becomes his men's tactician. He knows their strengths better than they do, so instead of collapsing without Timur at the forefront, the gang becomes more effective than ever. Soon, tribesmen from across Asia and the Middle East join Timur. He realizes that raiding travelers is child's play. Instead, he sets about conquering rival tribes and entire armies. In between battles, Timur manages to convince the Khans of rival tribes to listen to him. 
Slowly but surely, he ensures that all of these leaders follow his lead. Without realizing it, the Khans become figureheads with Timur calling the shots. By the late 1370s, Timur has succeeded in bringing many of the Mongolian tribes under his control. Technically, he is not the Khan of all these tribes. Instead, he's installed a puppet leader named Soyer Gatmish, who does all his bidding. Timur becomes the scourge of Persia. Timur knows that Persia is in a power vacuum. By the time he takes over the Mongolian tribes, he's already begun taking over the Persian outskirts closest to his empire. Once the tribes are united behind him, he knows that he can muster up enough strength to take over the entire region. At first, his amassed armies reach the city of Herat, which is controlled by the kingdom of Kartid. The people of Herat refuse to stand down. They think that they can hold off the horde. Instead, Timur begins a siege that tears the city apart. Then, Timur's men charge into the city, massacring every last man, woman, and child among the rubble. Eventually, all that's left are corpses, ruins, and Timur's blood-soaked soldiers. When news of the terrible destruction of Herat reaches the king of the region, he realizes that if he continues the war, there will be nothing left of his land. For the sake of sparing his surviving citizens, he stands down and lets Timur take over. Timur performs his most evil act. As Timur passes through the remaining kingdoms of Persia, he continues to offer cities and towns a simple choice, surrender or die. The people of the region of Khorasan had chosen to surrender. Timur's men, therefore, did not harm them. One year later, Timur has expanded westwards, meaning that Khorasan has only a small number of Timur's army remaining. The former leaders of Khorasan think that they can reclaim the land and that Timur will be too busy to come back to defend it. They are right about being able to reclaim the region, but wrong about Timur's inability to return. The leaders who are based within the city of Isfahan kill Timur's tax collectors. The people of the city are emboldened and kill Timur's small number of garrison troops. When Timur hears about what has happened, he is enraged. Soon, Timur has traveled hundreds of miles from the battlefield back to Khorasan with plenty of soldiers. Like Herat and so many other cities before it, the people of Isfahan endure a terrible siege. But once the siege is over, Timur's men act differently. Instead of slaughtering every last citizen, they round up prisoners. The people think that Timur has become merciful and will spare them. Then, Timur meets the survivors. He explains that, unlike Herat and other cities, he will not completely wipe Isfahan off the face of the earth. Instead, he is going to rebuild the city, and to do this, he will use them as construction material. He begins by lining up prisoners around in a gigantic square. The people are naturally scared. The soldiers force them to stand as still as statues. They bring tons of cement to the scene. The soldiers begin covering the prisoners' legs with cement and then their bodies. The men realize that they will all be sealed together with the cement burying them alive. Some men drown from swallowing cement. Others cover their mouths, preventing themselves from swallowing the cement only to suffocate. When the cement is dried, Timur orders more prisoners to stand on top of the foundation. Once more, these men are covered with cement. Eventually, the tower is completed. Timur then reassures the rest of the prisoners that they will not suffer in the same way. Cementing live people into a tower is too time-consuming, and he has battles to fight. Instead, he explains that only one part of their bodies will become towers, their heads. The soldiers proceed with beheading the rest of the prisoners. Then, they make 28 towers with the heads buried within more cement. No other city within the Khorasan region continues to resist. Timur leaves them in peace, but the people will forever be horrified at the idea of being cemented into buildings. Timur dies, leaving an empire. Timur spends the rest of his life fighting bloody campaigns. Thanks to his actions in Khorasan, no place that he defeated dares to rebel again. Timur lives to become an old man. He is either in his 60s or 70s when he finally dies. But at this point, he is planning his most ambitious military campaign of all time. In the months leading up to his death, he forms another huge army and begins advancing eastward, towards Ming Dynasty China. 
In December 1404, he manages to capture a Chinese envoy in what is now Kazakhstan. He plans a method of punishment and execution that would strike fear among the Chinese rulers when he falls ill. As the days pass, Timur fails to recover. He eventually passes away on February 17, 1405. Timur's grandson, Pir Mohammed, becomes the ruler of Timur's empire. One of the new emperor's first actions is to release the Chinese prisoners unharmed. They likely have no idea how close to incredibly painful and torturous deaths they had just been. The army never fights China. Pir Mohammed orders his men to return home. Pir Mohammed is bound to make the Timurian Empire a much more peaceful place, but his uncle Shah Rukh has other ideas. For the next two years, Rukh convinces Pir Mohammed's closest allies and advisors to follow his path. In 1407, these advisors kill Mohammed and place Rukh on the throne. Shah Rukh lives up to Timur's bloody legacy for another 40 years. Well, that's all we have for you. Don't forget to like and subscribe.